All right, everyone, so welcome. We're really glad to have you on board for our, our Horde Steriman monthly webinar series. Um, welcome to all the listeners that are on board today. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an editor for Horde Steriman magazine. I will serve as the host for today's webinar, which will focus on corn silage. For many of us, it's that time of the year again. Depending where you're listening from, perhaps you're in the midst of the chopping window, or maybe you're gearing up for it to begin in the next month or so. In any case, today's presentation will cover some dairy cattle, nutrition basics, and factors that go into harvesting the best corn silage you can for your herd. If you're listening to the presentation live, you have access to a PDF of the slides that can be printed. That handout can be found in the GoToWebinar control panel down in the handout section. Go ahead and print that out for future reference. Also, if you have any questions that are on your mind right now or that come up during the presentation, please type those into the questions section of that control panel and we'll answer them after the presentation. Today, we welcome John Gazer as our webinar presenter. John serves as the Animal Nutrition Director at Rock River Laboratory. He's also an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Animal and Dairy Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. On top of that, John is an agribusiness agribusiness consultant for Cows Agree Consulting, LLC. Dr. Gazer grew up in the dairy industry, following in his father's footsteps by pursuing a career in dairy nutrition. He earned a bachelor's and master's degree and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has been in his role at Rock River Laboratory since 2012, overseeing animal nutrition, technical support, and research. Dr. Gazer, welcome to the webinar, and I look forward to hearing your presentation titled, Make the Most of This Year's Corn Silage. Abby, to you and the Horde Steriman team, thank you for the opportunity to hopefully bring some great points out to our producers this year that will be harvesting corn for silage. As, as we get into thinking about projecting what the silage is going to look like this year, we're also going to take a little bit of a U-turn and, and talk about what our hay and haylage crops have looked like. So over the next roughly 45 minutes, uh, I look forward to covering a lot of different topics. And as Abby mentioned before, please grab hold of the PDF slide deck for some of the content that I might move through pretty quickly. I think I'm going to follow in Dr. Hutchins' footsteps as I look up to him, but I'm going to be moving pretty quickly uh, to make sure we cover a lot of different aspects that uh, we should watch out for in, in harvesting silage this year. So I gave a preview of the agenda, uh, but just in a few bullet points, we're going to continue farming in unprecedented times, and, and this comes from uh, global uncertainty in the, the food supply chain just to feed our, feed our human population to also uh, great swings in commodity prices which are affecting uh, our feed costs and inputs as we've all experienced in the last roughly year. The growing season at this point is roughly two-thirds in the books but as Abby and I were talking about there are producers to the southern half of the United States that have already harvested or are in the process of harvesting their silage and then those of us farming in the northern half of the United States uh, the harvest is looking like it's going to be a little bit later this year uh, but but I'm not really at the point where we're concerned uh, for, for uh, frost or, or, or killing frost. As I mentioned, we're going to get into what the hay and haylage crop, uh, crop looks like just with a few slides so that it somewhat sets the stage for what I expect uh, or project our corn crop to be looking at for looking like for silage. Uh, as I mentioned, and when we agreed to put this webinar together, at this point in mid-August, I, I thought we might be a little bit further along, but uh, we, we still have roughly a month to a month and a half to play out yet for a lot of growers. So we'll cover that. We'll talk about some key management points to, to watch out for as we get into harvesting our corn for silage, and then we'll wrap up. So as I tend to do with uh, a lot of the opportunities I have to present uh, di different concepts, different uh, webinars, uh, di different invited talks. I like to re both reflect back and project out what our economic conditions are uh, in the dairy industry. This is something I learned from my, my late dad, and uh, I appreciate Mark Linsmeyer and, and some other groups that do some similar work, but I tend to reference Mark's work. You can see here, uh, I've adapted some graphics from marginsmart.com. I get a weekly newsletter from Mark and their team. And what we have presented here are the projected margins per hundredweight of milk the next 12 calendar months or the next four quarters. So July 22 is in the books here. Uh, this came from the newsletter from July 29th. We closed the books on July and we're now into August. So we recognize pretty strong margins. We see the black line here. This is break even. And thankfully, uh, those of you that are, are feeding, helping to feed the world, uh, look to be compensated 
well, uh, provided we aren't locked in uh, to, to positions we took quite a while, while back, but anywhere between probably 50 cents and maybe two to three dollars per hundred weight projected out into the next 12 months. So certainly well deserved uh, for our hardworking men and women out there uh, producing dairy products. And so uh, we, we have some positive margins to look like. This is subject to change, of course, as we've seen uh, a little bit of a, a bearish movement in, in futures prices as of late, but we're still looking to be in the black for the next 12 months. So that's fantastic. And we need to keep our eye on the prize then in terms of producing milk efficiently. And so a lot of the, the topics we're going to get into today speak to efficiency in production. So as we wade into uh, the, the, the interaction between the growing environment, uh, crop quality, starting with hay and haylage, and then projecting out to corn silage, I think it's important, and as Abby and I were talking about the environmental conditions with drought relative to uh, rainfall, in, in some other areas, maybe heavier rainfall. So as this season has played out, we've had, I think, quite a bit of range to our, our growing conditions. As, as we were looking uh, at the drought conditions as of April, we certainly recognize those farming in the southern and western half of the U.S. This has been a long-standing issue, very severe drought. It doesn't look to have alleviated now as we would uh, compare and contrast April relative to August's drought monitor. In fact, I pulled this down uh, just as of this morning, but for those of you viewing and on demand, we, we're farming in dry to variable conditions. As we look at the Midwest through the Northeastern United States, uh, this variation or, or variability is showing up. In some areas, Northwest Iowa, uh, Northeastern Nebraska, Southeastern South Dakota, uh, even South uh, in south central Minnesota, where there's quite a few dairy cows in that area, and then northern Wisconsin, also quite a few dairy cows there, as well as in the northeast, upstate, and western New York, I guess western New York a bit more so, northern PA, drier conditions. So uh, we, we're at a sensitive spot right now as corn has been tasseling through these areas over the last two weeks to three weeks, roughly, and so the rainfall or lack thereof that we experience over the next few weeks is going to set the stage for what our grain fill and storage content looks like. So uh, if anything, at this point, I'm, I'm expecting an average to maybe a little bit more variable crop, and and, and this will begin to uh, make a little bit more sense as well as we look at some of the hay and haylage quality. Before we get into that, I just want to reflect back on our dairy nutrition basics. So we're not going to offer a course in animal nutrition here, but uh, one thing I like to do when sitting next to somebody on a plane or, or even with a, a group of producers is, is just talk about the opportunities in front of us with dairy cows. For an average dairy cow, today we're consuming somewhere around 55 pounds of dry feed. And I like to pull the audience on just asking the question, what do we think the average digestion of the total diet, the total ration consumed is? Uh, I get a range of, of answers as you can imagine, but on average we're around 62 to 65 percent total diet digestion, meaning for every 55 pounds of dry feed consumed, only 60 to 65 percent of that is digested, uh, so that equates to around 34 pounds. What that uh, should though be thought of is in terms of the opportunity around that because we know when transitioning crops and, and due to uh, many different factors, diet digestibility and animal performance and feed conversion efficiency uh, very tightly tied to profitability can range substantially. So uh, the better performing diets, the better performing dairy cows can achieve 70 to 75 percent diet digestion and achieve upwards of 40 to 42 pounds of total digested feed and, and what we know based upon research and running energy projections that every pound of total digestible nutrient that we can unlock equates to roughly three and a half pounds of milk. So the way that we get there is with having a, a higher quality feed and more digestible feed, which is the, the issue, the, the root of the discussion today. As we evaluate total digestible nutrients, we need to account for a couple things, and we're going to use this then as the basis for talking about hay and, and then also corn silage quality this year. We've talked a lot about nutrient digestibility and fiber digestibility over the last two decades, but we also need to account for just total fiber. Uh, fiber is important in dairy diets, but is the least digestible nutrient, so we, we tend to look for uh, haylage and, and corn silage. Uh, crops and hay crops with higher starch and protein concentrations because starch and protein are much more digestible than fiber. But when we look at energy per pound, that's actually total digestible nutrients. So summing up all of the nutrient content, uh, accounting for the nutrient digestibilities, bringing all of that together, uh, equating to a TDN. Uh, you can look for uh, an article in late September where I'm going to be getting into this in my feeding fundamentals column, just talking about the basics of coming up with a TDN number to evaluate uh, and predict, predict energy value. 
But when we look at TDN, just keep bear in mind, as, and as we discussed today, we're going to be looking at fiber, starch, and nutrient digestibility. So as we spend a few minutes looking at our hay and haylage crops, we're going to look from the west, the midwest, to the east. And I've got a few graphics that are going to set up like this. This is data adapted from Rockville Laboratory, where my colleague has reported out crop year-to-date nutrition analyses for several different growing seasons. So we've got 2019 through 2022 on the y-axis, and then there is going to be a parameter on the x-axis in the upper right-hand corner here that I'm showcasing with my cursor. This is fiber content in our hay crop out west. I have taken the liberty to include some green bold lines to reference benchmark values. So as I mentioned before, the more fiber we have in the crop, the less of the other valuable nutrients such as starch, protein, sugar we have. Uh, so we tend to like to see less than 40% fiber in our hay and haylage crop. So I've got that benchmark in here. And what we see out west is that we, uh, we've got a population distribution of all analyses reported by Rockefeller Laboratory in the uh, calendar year to date. We've got three horizontal black lines that equate to the 15th, 50th, and 85th percentile. So we see that our fiber content is down a little bit in our hay crop this year, uh, meaning our energy value is up as we see down here. Assessing the fiber digestibility, which Professor Combs' TTNDFD model gives us on a feed analysis report, we can see out west that fiber digestibility is up a little bit uh, and up substantially relative to a couple prior growing seasons in 2019 and 2020. I think this is tied into the extreme drought. So this isn't necessarily uh, advances in genetics, but it's tied into extreme drought conditions that we've been experiencing out west. As we transition to looking at the Midwestern haylage crop, uh, two things to point out here. One, our fiber content is up just a little bit. This means our relative feed value is unfortunately down. But the other aspect that I want to point out, and I'm going to hit on several times today, is just the wide spread to the quality and the results that we're seeing through the laboratory this year. So we see a little bit uh, more of a flatter distribution, kind of like a pancake. Uh, we, our, our average is up, and then it just looks like we have some more results that are a little bit higher in fiber content. And I think this is uh, due to mother nature, unfortunately. When we look at our TDN values, our digestible uh, nutrient and energy values, it's sort of a similar story. We see a little bit wider distribution of results in the Midwest. Uh, so this isn't horrific by any means to, to use that adjective, but, but uh, does speak to a little bit lesser quality and a little bit wider distribution of quality to the Midwest. And we see our fiber digestibility is also down uh, a little bit as well. When we look at the eastern haylage here, it's playing out a little bit more so. And again, I think this is due to growing conditions, uh, perhaps some untimely rains. So we see that year over year, 22 relative to 21, our fiber content is up and the distribution also looks to be a little bit wider. Uh, and when we see our fiber, or excuse me, our, our TDN, our energy levels, uh, these are actually down substantially for eastern haylages. So if you're not thrilled with your, your haylage quality grass or alfalfa in the eastern or midwestern U.S., you're certainly not alone. We're seeing this quite a bit through the laboratory. Uh, the TDN in the eastern half of the U.S. looks to be a, a, a little bit more affected by the fiber digestibility. So fiber content is up just a little bit, uh, dropping our energy, but also fiber digestibility is substantially down. Uh, again, I, I think this is due to growing conditions. We just see this really wide distribution in total track NDFD. Uh, so that is something that looks to be fairly widespread for the eastern half of the U.S. We do have a bit of insight uh, now that we're doing a bit more work with our, our southern dairies. Uh, we're starting to look at wheat silage. Uh, given the extreme drought, there was quite a bit of wheat that was just left uh, left fallow or left to go and not harvested, I know. But for the wheat quality that we do have, it looks to be fairly average year over year from 21 into 22. This would be wheat silage. So uh, one thing I have picked up for the our, our dairies in, in Texas and the, the High Plains, we, we do look to perhaps have two different crops. Uh, perhaps this is a, a milk cow and, and maybe a dry cow or, or a, a heifer hay. So the milk cow hay looks to be pretty high quality, the wheat hay or wheat silage, and, and then it looks like we've got a lower quality crop as well. So one thing I've recognized with wheat silage over the last couple of years is we can make pretty darn good milk cow feed, but we have to harvest it at the right time. We don't want to let it uh, get out to boot or, or extensively uh, transition into reproductive and, and grain setting. That, that fiber quality will drop substantially, but it looks like we've got a pretty, pretty good amount of dairy quality wheat silage to the south. So wrapping up the hay and hay, haylage crops, what we've seen to this point uh, through, through, I guess, two thirds of, of the season, our Western hay looks fantastic. As I mentioned, I think this is due to the drought conditions. Midwestern and Eastern haylages look to be 
uh, maybe a bit off to substantially off relative to 21. And then I just commented to our, our southern and southwest wheat sellers looking pretty good. So the, the point that I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I guess, echo several times over today and we're going to use to transition to corn silage is a widespread to quality. I'm, I'm fully anticipating this is going to carry into our corn silage uh, due to some of the factors that, that we've discussed at this point. So as we transition to discussing corn silage, uh, I'm, I'm going to take a maybe a little bit of a, a, a U-turn or, or a head down a different path and challenge us to think about spending 250 grand. Uh, and you're probably wondering uh, on, on the listening end of, of the discussion today, what, what does this have to do with our, our discussion at hand? But it'll make sense. I'll, I'll tie it together. So in spending $250,000, whether it be on a used implement or some hunting land, we go through our due diligence. We, uh, in, in, in experience, probably in, in making, making these purchases, if we're, if we're buying a used implement, we're, we're going to go and maybe have our mechanic look at it, maybe work work with that implement uh, for, for a few hours, uh, test it out in the field, thoroughly go through that to make sure that we're optimizing our $250,000 investment. In the case of buying some land, buying some hunter, hunting property, maybe tillable land, we're going to look at comparables. We're, we're going to do our homework before making that $250,000 investment. But if we transition to thinking about a $250,000 investment in corn silage, and we don't often think about it as such, but an average dairy cow, or a dairy farm of, of roughly 500 cows, and, and it'll probably be a bit smaller, be a bit smaller farm than this, will have invested $250,000 into their corn silage by the end of the year after that uh, silage is, is chopped harvested and sealed under plastic. So for 500 cows, roughly $250,000 investment in corn silage. And, and one thing I like to do is, is uh, question or challenge, are we doing everything we can to optimize that $250,000 annual investment? And I think a lot of cases we're not. We could probably look at doing a couple of things differently that we'll get into today. As we delve into the energy value of silage, and, and so I broke down the TDN equation before, but really when we're looking at silage quality, we're looking at uh, not only fiber, but starch, as I mentioned. And also we're starting to more so look at starch digestibility. And this will become important as we look at and reflect back what 2021 silage uh, did for us uh, after it was harvested. So uh, reflecting back to an article uh, wrote and published in, in 2020 in Hordes, Dairyman, we recognize that roughly 70% of the energetic value in corn silage was attributable to digestible fiber and digestible starch. And actually over 50% was due to digestible starch. So total starch content and then optimizing or hopefully achieving optimal starch digestibility to drive really solid energy value uh, in, in our corn silage. So with that in mind, uh, we, we, we need to be aggressive this year. Last year, as we've talked about the growing environment to this point, it's been quite wide distribution and growing conditions. What we saw in 2021 was very similar. And what we recognized after six to nine months and, and the corn silage uh, quality was, was fully understood was that silage was a drag and, and it wasn't necessarily attributable to fiber or fiber digestibility uh, to the metrics we'd look at on our feed analysis report in years past to determine uh, silage quality, but actually starch digestibility really was hampered last year. So uh, I, what, what that was due to was growing conditions. We had uh, pretty hot conditions coupled with rainfall through the, the grain filling period. And what we ended up with uh, was, was a little bit of a disconnect between kernel maturity and, and uh, whole plant moisture, which we'll come back to. So we've got a graphic here where we're looking at corn silage, uh, ruminant situ starch digestibility. This gives us an indication of just how soft that starch is, how digestible it is, uh, and, and gives us an idea of, is this silage feeding to its full potential? So. Uh, around mid-July, when I pulled this graphic down, we still saw quite a wide distribution to starch digestibility for 2021 uh, relative to the same dates in 2020 and 2019. So I have a little bit different graphic to showcase why that was the case. I've got 2021 analyzed corn silages for the eastern and midwestern U.S. relative to the same time period, but for 2021 harvested corn silage. So 2020 crop on the left, 2021 crop on the right. And these are hundreds of thousands of samples analyzed for starch digestibility as part of commercial silage analyses by Rockefeller Laboratory. So what I've got here is overlaid a, uh, I guess it'd be brown or green, my, my uh, color recognition isn't all that great. Uh, but what we see here is the improvement in starch digestibility as this corn silage is packed and fermenting in the silo. So uh, uh, when, when we chop silage green, our starch digestibility is typically pretty low, 60 to 70%. That's that fresh corn, that new crop slump, if you want to think about it like that. But as we leave it in the silo, 
and it ferments out, starch digestibility improves. And then at some point we reach the optimal fermentation where the silage is feeding to its full potential. In 2020 crop, a ways back, I know, but we, we reached our optimal potential pretty quickly. That, that starch was maybe a little bit softer coming out of the field and, and the fermentation potential was pretty strong. So after two to three months, we achieved our optimum silage feeding potential. Contrast that with 21, nowhere close. And again, I think this was mostly due to growing environment. I don't think this was necessarily uh, genetics, but I think growing environment, perhaps maybe a little bit more mature kernels uh, relative to maybe a little bit wetter plant. Uh, we harvested at the right time as far as whole plant dry matter or whole plant moisture, but it looks like our kernels were a little bit more advanced this year. So that's going to, or last year. So that's going to be something we need to keep an eye out for this year is watching kernel maturity as well as whole plant moisture as we time our harvest. So we saw starch digestibility down five to maybe seven, unit, seven units at harvest. And we saw that it took an extra maybe two, three, four months for us to reach that full feeding potential of corn salad. So bear this in mind now as we think about this year, especially with $6 corn, we have to optimize every bushel of corn coming in through our silage to hopefully cut back on our supplemental grain and costs associated. So as I've looked at projecting when we're gonna harvest silage before we get into some of the key points uh, to, to control when we're harvesting this year, I've utilized a couple tools. Uh, so you can reference these websites uh, for the Midwestern or through the Northeastern United States. These are corn growing degree day calculators where we can plug in planting date, we can plug in relative maturity, and we can look at the accumulated growing degree days and then using historical data, we can do some projections out to when uh, corn will achieve black layer. I was using these tools back prior to tasseling, so earlier in July, to help some of our, our teammates, some of the clients that I work with, some producers, project out when we would be harvesting silage this year. Uh, one of my seed company clients, I had the opportunity to look at a wide array of plots that they had planted all over the United States where they had location, planting date, and relative maturity. Uh, that gave me some awesome insight into when uh, we can project and anticipate cutting corn for silage will be. What I saw when I went through that, uh, that assessment on behalf of the client was we're going to be cutting corn in September to late September. And there may be even a few of you that are still working through uh, cutting corn for silage in early October. But we are a good two to four weeks behind where we were last year. Uh, that, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just something to be aware of right now. We've got a couple extra weeks uh, here in the growing season and maybe a couple extra weeks to plan, maybe get your kernel processor ready, get your harvester out or, or work with your uh, custom harvester to just ensure we have our ducks in a row, so to speak. Over the last week uh, or two, I guess at this point, I also want to make note of Professor Joe Lauer, Dr. Joe Lauer at the University of Wisconsin. He published a blog post that has some fantastic insight. This is something that uh, in working with Randy Shaver uh, and some others, we've talked about the interaction in projecting quality uh, that, that we can expect at the end of the year, but we've talked about the interaction between growing environment and anticipated forage quality. And, and I had some ideas based upon experience and a little bit of research that, out, that, that existed out there. But uh, in Joe's most recent blog post uh, that you can see referenced here at wiscorn.blogspot.com, go check out his latest blog post. Uh, he explains it in some detail, but what he did was looked back on 30 plus years of plots that he has managed and he qualified the growing seasons, uh, at least the first half of the year, the, the, the growing season uh, relative uh, temperature and moisture relative to long-term averages and then uh, equated that back to the, the quality that was harvested at the end of the year. And what I had previously assumed was that uh, really wet, cool conditions or really warm and dry conditions would equate to higher quality. That's not necessarily what Joe saw though. So we have forage yield in the top here for corn silage, fiber digestibility in the bottom left, and starch content in the bottom right. And I'm not gonna go through this in much detail, but what Joe saw was when he looked at the, the drier or wetter conditions, uh, of course, both of those uh, impacted forage quality uh, to the negative just, or excuse me, forage yield to the negative just a bit, looked like a half ton and maybe a ton down in yield. But in terms of fiber digestibility, where I focus more of my attention on the quality side, uh, he saw that both cooler and warmer conditions could be equated to fiber digestibility. In terms of precip, uh, and rainfall, this is where uh, what Joe uh, assessed and, and uncovered was a little bit different than I understood. Wet, really wet growing conditions actually equated to lower fiber digestibility, whereas uh, that warm and then the dry conditions equated to a little bit higher 
fiber digestibility. That was interesting. Starch content that also looked to increase a little bit in these warm and dry conditions. And, and this doesn't necessarily make sense uh, upon first review, but I think this is attributable to just plant height and, and stature. I, I think the today's seed genetics are fantastic on, yeah, with drought resistance, drought tolerance, and putting on a good ear, even in some really dry conditions, but really that plant height and the amount of stover that's out there will be quite a bit less. So when we look at the grain to stover ratio dictating the starch content, uh, I think that's probably an expl explanation as to why we see higher starch content in these drier years. So pretty interesting observations and please check out Joe's website to, to dig into this a little bit more so I know I will be. From a plant disease standpoint, th uh, this is another hot topic right now. Uh, working and in, in, in texting and communicating with my colleague Damon Smith, University of Wisconsin, uh, in plant pathology. He's out working hard in the fields, I know. I know he's running left and right uh, seven days a week, seemingly, but we're on the lookout for tar spot right now. Uh, Michigan State has also published uh, a pretty interesting review of ear and stalk rot and then the resulting mycotoxins in corn silage. I'd encourage you to look out. Actually, Mike Rankin, I want to give him credit, he pointed this out to me. Uh, but we continue to be, uh, I would say, on high alert from, from an ear and stalk rot standpoint, and more so tar spot. Uh, what Damon told me earlier is due to the drier conditions for many growers that I, I talked about and showcased with a drought monitor report, we aren't necessarily seeing a lot of ear and stalk rot in gibberella or fusarium, but right now we are on high alert for tar spot. And with some of the rains that have come come in as of late, I think this is something that we're going to need to be really closely working with our agronomists and walk fields. I mean, that, that would be my, my watch out and take home point. Get out, walks and fields, encourage your, your agronomists to do so. If we start to see tar spot show up into our fields, we need to be ready to go now. Uh, if we historically have two to three to weeks two to three weeks to chop silage based on our relative maturity and how we have our field stage. If tar spot comes in heavily, that may be condensing. So we need to be ready to go. So be, be on the lookout for tar spot. We don't have maybe a, a huge concern right now, but it is out there. We are starting to see it in some fields and, and it's gonna play out. So let's get into now key watchouts for uh, optimizing our silage quality this year. Uh, when we think back to uh, making corn for silage three to five years ago, we've been doing it in different uh, different economic conditions. Corn has been anywhere from three to five bucks. Well, now we're in the five and a half, six, six and a half dollar corn range. So we need to better think of our, our corn silage crop as harvesting grain as well as forage. As Mike Rankin uh, rightfully pointed out to me in a meeting a couple of weeks back, it's really a 50-50 proposition. We're harvesting a lot of grain, and that's very valuable grain. So we're going to go through some harvest uh, key harvest points and then a couple points relative to just ensiling and preserving that to feed out. So I'm going to hit on moisture and kernel maturity first. This has been somewhat of a debated topic as we've looked at the right time to harvest corn silage, but what I like to do is compare and contrast uh, harvesting corn silage a little bit wetter relative to a little bit drier. So what we have here is a graphic showcasing samples analyzed by Rock River Laboratory harvested between 30 and 30. 35% dry matter. Uh, so this would be one class, a little bit wetter silage or 65 to 70% moisture relative to 40 to 45% dry matter, which would be 55 to 60% moisture. So here we see starch content for hundreds of thousands of samples analyzed by the lab. The drier we let the corn go, the more mature it is in the field, it does accumulate more starch. So in theory, more starch, less fiber would be a good thing from an energy standpoint. But what we see is we actually have a drop off or a simultaneous drop off in starch digestibility. So we have our optimal point uh, in terms of grain hardness in the field or lack thereof, somewhere around 65% uh, moisture probably, 62 to, to maybe 70. We're, we're optimizing at about 82% rumen starch digestibility. But as we go beyond 60% uh, uh, less than 60% moisture or greater than 40% diameter, we have a drop off in fiber digestibility as that grain gets harder and harder. And we see it pretty profoundly uh, as we go beyond 55, lower than 55% moisture. Uh, an interesting aspect that looking at data in this fashion, uh, I, I've been able to uncover fiber digestibility as well. I mean, if we look at simply an XY graph, it looked like a shotgun. We probably couldn't pick out too much in relationships with moisture relative to uh, different measures. But when we classify data in this fashion and then look at distributions of the results uh, with these different classes, we also can pick up on a few unit difference in fiber digestibility. I think this is real. So as that plant matures in the field, uh, progresses further toward black mire layer, we, we, we've got more and more dead tissue. We've got just a 
little bit more of a woody stock, less digestible stock. So we have roughly three units less fiber digestibility as well. So we've got more starch, but less starch digestibility, less fiber digestibility. And when I run some economic and, and milk projections, what I did in this case was compare and contrast a little bit wetter silage with a little bit drier silage. And I ran these through average diets and what I projected out was actually there's similar milk production potential when we're feeding 19 to 20 pounds of the, each of these silages per, per cow per day. So uh, again, I, I know there has been some, some uh, suggestion to harvest our silage a little bit drier, capture a little bit more starch, but I'm not necessarily a fan of that idea because I think the drop off in fiber and starch digestibility coupled with the risk factor of uh, what may happen if, if we let our silage uh, or our corn for silage get a little bit drier and if tar spot comes in or we don't get it harvested as quickly and maybe the fermentation isn't as strong. I think risk coupled with the nutrient digestibility would uh, lend us to thinking about harvesting a little bit on the wetter side just to end up with a, a little bit higher quality silage as well as a little bit less risk. So that's my opinion, not saying everybody's going to be in agreement, but I'm happy to take my stance and defend it accordingly. When talking about processing, this is another hot topic. I mean, as we look at kernel processing store score and kernel processing, it's been pretty cool to be part of these discussions the last few years. So we've got a similar graphic as to what I portrayed for hand haylage crops, but in this case, we're looking at kernel processing year, uh, looking at 2016 all the way through 2021 grown silage. Uh, historically, our benchmarks have been 50, 60, 70 meaning 60% was average, 50% was inferior, and 70% was the goal. You can see 70% has been uh, indicated by this orange line here on this graphic, and 60%, the old average, you can see actually corresponds to 15% or less samples now. So our industry, uh, our self-propelled self -propelled forage harvesters, our custom harvesters have done and I think the goalposts have shifted. We're now seeing the upper 15th percentile, which I think should be our goal in that 75 to 80 neighborhood for our kernel processing score. So think about pushing the envelope, especially with $6 corn. When we break it down by region, actually the Western US has done a great job in getting most of our kernels processed from that 70 to 80% kernel processing score. So what that means uh, is 70 to 80% of the kernels are effectively obliterated and, and none of the grain, none of the starch uh, is greater than 4.7 millimeters in width, which is the equivalent of roughly a 22 caliber bullet if you think about plinking. We can see the, the Southwest, Midwest and East, we got relatively normal normal distributions, but our averages are substantially less. So I still think there's some opportunities in kernel processing score and consider pushing the envelope this year with, with pretty expensive grain. So as I mentioned, our, I think our new goal is 75 to 80 percent. 80 percent kernel processing score is certainly possible. Uh, I also want to point out that KPS will increase through fermentation. So if you use the KPS laboratory assessment at harvest, uh, maybe add five to ten units to that for what you would expect the KPS to be after fermentation. These data that uh, my, my friend and colleague, Professor Ferreto has shared with me, recognize that a 60% KPS at day zero will equate to roughly a 65 to 68% to KPS after 120 to 240 day, 240 days. So keep this in mind, uh, set, your, set your goal, maybe five to 10 units below where you want it to be uh, with fermented forage if you're checking KPS at harvest. Transitioning then to discussing the ensiling process, uh, there are a lot of aspects that go into effective preservation. I, I didn't necessarily get academically trained in this area, but thanks to um, uh, Keith Bolson, uh, Rich Mock, Chris Bosick driver um, a number of other exceptional scientists and, and teammates, I've learned a lot about the ensiling process, and there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, this year, with as valuable as corn grain and silage stands to be, I think using an inoculant is a great decision. You can think about it like an insurance policy uh, to, to preserve every pound of digestible nutrient possible. And corn silage is also pretty prone to yeast and mold deterioration upon feedout. So when we use bacterial inoculants or forage preservative, uh, chemical-based preservatives, we have a couple goals that, that we can seek to achieve, one being preserving the feed as fast as possible after we've got it sealed up and in plastic or in the silo. The other though being more stable and cleaner feed upon feed out. This is an area we're getting into more and more and more. So ask your uh, nutritionist, ask your uh, your teammates, maybe your forage harvesting crew, if you're working with an inoculant or preservative uh, company, ask them what approach would be right for your dairy. Uh, but I, I think both upfront fermentation and feed out stability are very important. Uh, relative to preserving and hopefully uh, achieving 
feed out of every ton we put in that that silo this year. Rapid filling is quite important. To, if your dairy takes uh, traditionally four to six weeks to, to make silage, that's a long time for that silo to be open unless we're filling uh, traditional upright silos or, or bags. If we're feeding a bunker or piles and it's taking us three to four weeks, that's a long time for that pile to be open. So perhaps consider splitting your silage in, into two different piles if possible and, and filling each of the two piles a little bit more quickly. Uh, from a packing and covering standpoint, uh, a, a good thumb rule from a packing standpoint is count the number of tons being delivered to the silo, and that silo is uh, fairly broad in, in meaning. It could be upright or, or it could be bunker or pile. Uh, but in terms of where we're packing silage for bunkers and piles, for every hundred tons, uh, or excuse me, every, yeah, every hundred tons that we're delivering to the pile, we want to multiply that number by 800 to figure out the amount of weight we want on in the pack tractor or pack tractors. Uh, on top of that pile to get that that uh, pile or bunker effectively packed and, and achieve optimum as fed density. And from a covering standpoint, get it covered as soon as possible. I know from experience covering the pile uh, or bunkers is not a fun process, but leaving a pile open for even another day or two, especially in the event that we get a little bit of unexpected rainfall, can have pretty detrimental effects on the, not only the top foot, but possibly the top three to four feet of that, that pile, which uh, upon feed out, even if we pitch off the spoiled feed that, that we can visualize, there's probably an area that's 50 to 100% uh, larger than that where uh, microbial deterioration is happening. So uh, try and get it covered as soon as possible. If you're looking at uh, acquiring some corn, uh, standing corn from, from neighbors or, or other growers for silage to, to maybe fill out your inventory, it's not going to go into these in, in much detail, but just to point out that there are some good tools out there. Uh, Hay and Forage Grower had a nice article uh, last year around this time uh, from Mike Rankin. You can reference that here in terms of some tools available to price corn silage, or you can reach out to me. Uh, I've got some simple tools where we use the corn price in terms of dollars per bushel uh, and, and then use that pro to project out the corn silage value relative to the amount of corn grain in that silage. So there are a lot of different strategies here, but there are tools available. So if you find yourself in this position and need help, your nutritionist, uh, as well as some of the references here can help out. Then hopefully after a successful uh, corn harvest for silage season, we're gonna turn the page pretty quickly on selecting our corn for 2023. So I'm not gonna get into this in too much depth, but wanna offer maybe a few points to think about if you're uh, uh, gonna be choosing your corn and, and seed corn in the, in the next couple of months for silage in 2023. Uh, we tend to look at and, and reflecting back on that TDN equation and, and uh, understanding what points bring value to our, our feed quality and our silage quality and, and taking that into account with our seed selection. We look for uh, good yielding uh, silage. We look for fiber digestibility in a lot of cases. And in some cases we can uh, consider a, a really unique corn for silage such as brown midrib corn. And I, I think brown midrib relative to conventional seed, these are two very distinct uh, types of corn and achieve very different intended objectives. And uh, at the laboratory, we are able to actually separate BMR versus non-BMR silage samples sent to the lab because our industry tends to be pretty good at labeling BMR corn silage. Uh, I often get, what's the best seed genetics? What are you seeing for hybrids coming through the laboratory? Unfortunately, we don't have much data there because the, the descriptions, while they will label BMR, don't necessarily label, we don't label our hybrid IDs. Uh, and in the event we have a few different hybrids that we're putting into our silage, it all gets blended together. We don't know what's what, but uh, we do have some ability to look at BMR versus non-BMR. And I'm gonna make a couple points with this. Uh, and again, relative to our, our seed selection for 23, we do see quite a bit higher fiber digestibility. So this is BMR analyzed in 2017 through 2021 crop years by Rock River Laboratory. And we see a lot of different parameters on this graphic, but I'm gonna point out a couple things. The red line would be samples labeled BMR analyzed by Rock River Laboratory from east to west coast. And we see a pretty sizable increase in fiber digestibility. This makes sense. This is what we expect from BMR. Uh, but we also see a, a little bit less starch content and grain content in BMR. So that's something to take into account as you're looking at, if you're considering BMR relative to non-BMR, just giving up a little bit in corn grain, that's gonna need to be supplemented back or is gonna need to be considered in an economic evaluation. The other thing I wanna point out, and it, it represents the interaction between seed genetics and the growing environment, there are years where there are very similar 
nutrient profile. So in 2017, for example, the fiber and starch con, or excuse me, the starch content in BMR and non-BMR uh, labeled samples was very similar. However, in 2021, the spread between BMR labeled samples and non-BMR labeled samples stretched out to roughly three to potentially four units in starch. And what this represents is an interaction between seed genetics and growing environment. And so uh, take this into account if you're selecting your corn, if, if you are using only one year's worth of data, perhaps on your farm and projecting what's gonna be the best for your next year, it may not be the best approach because there will be interactions with the growing season and the seed genetics. Uh, just a few other points for us to consider. If you're uh, prioritizing fiber digestibility quite highly uh, in, in your seed evaluation, I, I do think that is uh, a, a valuable selection point. Uh, what we've seen in the past when we've looked at this data came from a 2018 internship survey that's that's been pretty cool as we looked at energy corrected milk production on the y-axis relative to silage quality on the x-axis. These were 60 different dairy herds that we surveyed uh, and we assessed their silage quality. And then when we were looking uh, at graphics, we recognized that silage quality, this is NDFD 30 and, and Professor Combs TTNDFD, we saw roughly a pound of milk for every unit increase in fiber digestibility. That was pretty profound. And now uh, nutritionists, and we we're starting to use undigestible fiber at 240 hours. This is our new measurement in lignin. Uh, we do recognize that cows aren't able to eat as much feed the more UNDF that's in that silage. So that was pretty interesting. And, for these dairies in northeastern Wisconsin. So fiber digestibility uh, matters as much today as it did a number of years ago, but uh, we do need to bear in mind also that we, we can't necessarily ignore starch either. Um, one last, last graphic, not speaking strictly to uh, milk responses, but I think we also need to think more in terms of feed conversion efficiency. We do also see fiber digestibility positively correlate to feed conversion efficiency. So it's not simply the cows can eat more. It looks like they can do more with each pound of feed they consume. So hopefully that makes sense. But for a 10 unit increase in silage NDFD, looks like we have around 0.5 uh, unit increase in feed conversion efficiency. And so that might be as much as 25 uh, cents in, in feed cost per hundred weight if, if you look at your feed cost per hundred weight. So uh, that wraps up uh, most of what I had to speak to in terms of corn silage uh, topics and points. I look forward to discussion here maybe in, in, in a couple of minutes. I did want to spend a minute also speaking to snaplage. So as we looked at the uh, classification of corn silage samples broken into different different buckets or different classes, if you will, and the impact on that quality, we've looked at snaplage in a similar fashion. And so snaplage has been a, a, a more popular feed as of late because we can use our self-propelled harvesting equipment to go out and get this higher starch, uh, sort of high moisture corn-like feed out of the field, uh, but with a little bit greater fiber content as well. But timing snaplage, looking at uh, both kernel maturity and moisture, it's been debated, maybe a little bit more debated even than, than corn silage uh, moisture and maturity and kernel maturity. So as we looked at our Rock River Laboratory data, uh, what I tend to look at is the starch content like I did for corn silage and then the starch digestibility. And in some cases, we've also looked at soluble crude protein as an indication of how well snaplage ferments. And what we see here, a little bit smaller graphic, but it looks like as the the corn crop and snaplage uh, dries out and matures from 45 to 50 percent dry matter, 50 to 55 percent dry matter, 55 to 60, we achieve optimum starch content as we get to black layer of around 58 percent. It looks like around 45, 40 to 45 percent moisture or 55 to 60 percent dry matter is where we achieve uh, the optimal starch content as that grain finishes up in maturation. Uh, and as it was the case with silage, we see a drop off in rumen starch digestibility as that grain uh, continues to harden toward and beyond black layer. So uh, we see pretty close to our optimum rumen starch digestibility then around that same time that we achieve our optimal uh, starch content at 55 to 60% dry matter or 40 to 45% moisture. So for me, I, I think this is a, a sweet spot, if you will, to target for harvesting snaplage, uh, 40 to 45% moisture. And I also think we're going to have pretty solid fermentation around that point as well. So we're going to achieve uh, close to our optimal starch. Looks like our starch digestibility is going to be really strong coming out of the field. And then I think we're going to have adequate uh, moisture in that forage to ferment it. I guess it's sort of a, a more of a grain to ferment it as well. So with that, we've gotten through a lot of content today. Uh, again, I've, I've followed in hopefully what, uh, 
Dr. Hutchins' footsteps here and moving through quite a bit of valuable content, but with a pretty good pace. And if you'd like to reach out to me beyond today's webinar or you're viewing this on demand, please feel free to uh, check in with me at my email as shown here. Uh, jump on with me on social media. We can go back and forth uh, on Twitter, hopefully discussing some great dairy nutrition topics, or feel free to reach out to me uh, with a text or a phone call as well. John, thank you so much for sharing all that information today. Um, I think you you delivered very valuable content and at a great pace. So we appreciate the work you did to prepare for everything um, for this webinar. If you would like to view this webinar again or share with anyone else, it will be available on our website later this week. We archive all of our webinars and they can be found on the hordes.com website at our webinars tab. So if you're looking for um, past webinars on any topic, feel free to check out that web page and um, review some of those former webinars. But this one will be available later this week for you to look at again or to share with others. Um, we do hope you'll make plans to attend another webinar. And if we go ahead one slide, I'll show you a few of our future webinars. Next month in September, we'll be talking about dairy cattle inflammation. And um, sometimes it gets a reputation as being a bad thing, but Dr. Barry Bradford from Michigan State University will be talking with us about all the valuable um, aspects of inflammation as well and some of the new research that's being done in this topic. So that will be our presentation for September. And then in October, we'll have Becky Larson from the University of Wisconsin-Madison talking about selecting and integrating manure processing technology. So if either of those topics are of interest to you, please make plans to attend. And as always, our webinars always take place on the second Monday of every month at noon Central Standard Time. Now, we did have some questions that came in prior to the webinar, so we will go through those first. And then if you have any questions, feel free to type those into the questions section of the control panel. We have a good group already, but we have some time here. So please um, send your thoughts in if you have anything you'd like to know from Dr. Gazer. The first question came to us from Indiana, and this person asked, how do you decide when to use a silage inoculant for corn silage? And then what are some of the advantages and are there disadvantages of using inoculants? This is a great question, one that we've been faced with for a couple of decades now as, as we've had more and more research and then also more products hitting the market. I spoke to a little bit earlier a couple different objectives we can take on when looking at, at a bacterial inoculant. Uh, one being upfront fermentation, and then the second being uh, feed stability and, and uh, feed cleanliness. One thing I probably didn't drive home enough uh, earlier on in the webinar, but was uh, when, when harvesting our silage, we, we need to look at both whole plant moisture and kernel maturity. So while I advocate for 65 to 68 percent moisture when beginning harvest, we also need to take into account our kernel maturity. If we've got more advanced kernel maturity like we did last year, then, then we should probably uh, go a little bit wetter. So then after we make that decision to harvest and we're looking at uh, applying an inoculant, I'm a big advocate of research-backed bacterial inoculants. There are quite a few products on the market that have solid research, uh, Dr. Lehman Kong, uh, Luis Ferreto. I mean, there's just a, a host of great scientists that have done really good work uh, looking at the benefits of inoculant on corn silage. So I can I can say pretty conclusively that there can be, uh, in terms of advantages, uh, dry matter recovery savings. What does this mean? The average uh, dairy for every hundred tons of corn uh, corn that we chop out of the field for silage, there's some dry matter uh, fermentation losses. Ideally, those are only probably four to seven percent of the total dry matter. Uh, harvested, meaning we um, unfortunately lose through, through dry matter losses four to seven tons out of every hundred harvested. However, uh, if we don't apply an, an inoculant, we don't do a good job sealing our silos, that could be 10 to 15 percent, meaning for every hundred ton we harvest, we might lose 10 or 15 tons just due to uh, microbes chewing up the, the very good digestible nutrients. So that's one of the primary advantages is, is just improving our dry matter recovery or, or lessening our dry matter losses. Uh, the other advantage would be that feed out stability. So Lactobacillus buchneri uh, is a type of bacteria in inoculant that has been really well documented to uh, prevent yeast and mold growth upon opening silage back up. So for growers in the Midwest or the Northeast, we have really high yeast and mold levels historically due to uh, more temperate growing conditions coupled with uh, fairly humid uh, conditions throughout the year. So we, we tend to deal with a lot of yeast and mold contamination and yeast and mold. And this is wild, wild spoilage yeast and mold. Um, 
not the beneficial yeast we, we might put in the diet uh, from a probiotic standpoint. So uh, that would be uh, another a strategy we could take that's been shown to keep feed cleaner upon opening the silage back up. So two different advantages. In terms of disadvantages, uh, I think cost first and foremost. So inoculants uh, are anywhere between 25 cents and upwards of $3 per ton, depending upon uh, what the product is, if we're achieving objectives one or two or objectives one and two. So quite a wide range in inoculant uh, costs. But from a disadvantage standpoint, I, I don't really know that there are any disadvantages besides cost. I mean, with $6 corn, as I mentioned before, we need to be preserving every pound, every ton, uh, of valuable corn that we're harvesting out of the field. So I think this is definitely a year uh, to, to make an investment in inoculants. Uh, if you've been doing so for some time, you've recognized the, the benefit. If not, I think this is a year to think about it. Thank you for that thorough answer on that. Very good. Um, our next question on the next slide came in from Iran. So again, we have listeners from all over the world here and we really appreciate that. Um, this person's wondering, what's the optimum in siling time? So maybe we'll answer that question first. You know, that, that's a good question. And as I showcased with the starch digestibility graphic, where we looked at 2020 relative to 2021, I mean, a, a textbook answer would be at minimum three months, ideally six months. But it depends upon the growing year. It depends upon the corn grain hardness. Uh, the value in corn silage feeding to its full potential comes from the grain and the extent that it ferments provided we obliterate the kernel and do a great job of the kernel processing so in 2020 we could let it sit for two to three months and and we were golden in 2021 if we would have had six to eight months of inventory that would have been more ideal i, I know that there were a lot of dairies that suffered from new crop slump uh, and had to battle with it for quite some time, feeding 2021 corn and silage and had to push quite a bit higher starch levels. So uh, it's a little bit more of a complex answer, but I think if we can uh, maybe get a few samples, of course, I work for the lab, right? So I'll always tell you to sample till you're blue in the face. But if, if we can get a few samples around harvest and use that as a benchmark from year over year, that might help us understand what kind of inventory we might want to put up so that we can hopefully let it ferment the right amount of time because every ton of corn silage that we have on concrete i recognize the, the cash investment and that those are dollars that are not able to be used elsewhere so we want the minimum carryover and inventory on hand but it will change from year to year those are great points and just how important that ensiling period is to make sure that feed is delivering the new the best nutrient package it can for the cows um, the next question here does using an epiphytic probably saying that wrong, bacteria in the same region from where it came make a better corn silage. Any thoughts there? You, you knocked it out of the park in terms of uh, enunciation. Uh, that, that is the right term, epiphytic. So epiphytic bacteria are wild or natural bacteria. Uh, I, I think this question is a little bit different and unique. Uh, what, what I'm going to assume here is that epiphytic bacteria may be included in a bacterial inoculant. Uh, and, and if this is used as a bacterial inoculant, can that make for better silage? Interesting question. I'm not aware of any literature uh, that really delves into this. I know there are a lot of silent, silage science papers published out there. Uh, in terms of uh, general bacterial inoculants, uh, there are uh, a number of workhorse species out there, which I won't go through by name, but I don't know that those have been isolated necessarily from the region where the uh, corn was grown for silage. So in general, I don't think it matters. Uh, what matters more so is having solid research uh, backing up the bacterial inoculants and perhaps uh, applied in, in uh, on corn grown in different areas, demonstrating eff efficacy and repeatability. Okay, very good. All right, now we're going to go to the questions that came in during the presentation. So first one here, what is the expected difference in the starch digestibility when kernel processing is used? Oh, awesome question. Uh, so in that 2018 study, we had uh, we, we looked at kernel processing score relative to rumen starch digestibility and uh, fecal starch as an indication, like Hutch has shown us for years, of total tract starch digestibility. And uh, the results were, uh, we certainly saw better rumen starch digestibility and fecal starch with kernel processing. I wanna say the range in rumen starch digestibility was roughly 10 units, uh, and, and I, I reserve the right to be wrong, I'm often wrong, but I wanna say the range was roughly 10 units over the spread we saw in kernel processing score from, from let's say 50 to 80. So uh, if, if we gain maybe 10 units in KP, uh, that, that might equate to two to three units of rumen starch digestibility, if, if I'm just thinking on the fly here. All right, 
Um, going back to inoculants, do you prefer heterofermentative or homofermentative or a mixture of the two? Yeah, so here this speaks to objective one and two. Uh, so let's see how well I can reason through this. Homofermentative bacteria would be those uh, directed at primarily upfront fermentation. So uh, digesting some soluble carbohydrate, uh, the, the homofermentative bacteria will produce lactic acid primarily uh, and hopefully very little acetic acid. Uh, we can have a pretty perfect conversion of dry matter, meaning we're going to take every ton from the field and hopefully feed that back out with our homofermentative organisms. Those are going to be your upfront fermenters, achieving that objective one, getting that feed and siled as fast as possible, hopefully in as little as seven to 14 days uh, in terms of reaching its stable pH after the, the silage has been covered in plastic. The heterofermentative organisms would be those like lactobacillus buchneri that do uh, a little bit of upfront fermentation, but then also have a secondary fermentation uh, where they may uh, convert some lactic acid uh, to, to acetic acid, for example, uh, or, or produce some other compounds such as 1,2-propane diol. So there's kind of a couple pathways at play. So the heterofermentative organisms would be uh, looking to achieve objective two, which would be that feed out stability. And then if we had a combination of both, the homo and fermentative uh, bacteria, really challenging my enunciation today. Hopefully I've had enough coffee to carry this through okay. Uh, the combination of, of one and two would, would be uh, working to optimize upfront fermentation while also working to achieve optimal feed out stability. So I wouldn't prioritize one above the other. Uh, I think they're both very different objectives, uh, but in, in the best case, we would have both at play. So we may have some homo fermentative organisms uh, present in our bacterial inoculant, as well as hetero fermentative organisms that will uh, help us achieve that optimal feed out stability after say three to four months of fermentation. Thank you for that explanation. Here, someone's wondering your thoughts on corn silage made with um, am corn that has amylase that is that is currently available. Sure. Uh, so th th there's a there's a corn uh, seed corn on the market with, with a, a technology that brings uh, amylase expressed in the kernel. And, and in full transparency, uh, I've worked with this group uh, quite closely. Uh, have done some private consulting on their behalf to help analyze uh, data and, and help to, to look at some of the work. Uh, the, the market name is Enogen. So what Enogen appears to bring uh, to corn silage is uh, roughly seven to 10 unit improvement in rumen starch digestibility, both in fresher silage as well as fermented silage based upon some of the data I've seen. Uh, it is strictly a starch digestibility uh, technology. It appears at this point uh, we've seen some data uh, all over the map in terms of fiber digestibility, but that amylase expressed in the kernel uh, and in the, uh, in the silage perhaps does look to increase rumen starch digestibility by way of that amylase probably uh, chopping up starch and, and making starch a little bit more digestible in that silage. Okay, another question related to starch. So what's the best way to harvest um, corn with a high starch content? snaplage, earlage, or high moisture corn? Um, I guess what should, maybe they're wondering what you should do with a crop that has high starch content. Sure, so uh, one thing we didn't talk about today, and I, I think it's partly due to uh, maybe a little bit shorter crop in general, maybe not optimal tonnage this year due to the, the variable growing conditions that I described before. Uh, we, we can increase starch content by raising the cutter head up. That's not something I'm talking about with the majority of our crop this year, just because I think it's shorter in stature. Uh, but in terms of snaplage relative to high moisture corn, high moisture corn, we need to combine snaplage. We need, uh, and we can utilize our self-propelled harvester. So I, I'm seeing snaplage become more and more popular. I, I think it can be great feed. Both high moisture corn and snaplage though uh, are, are subject to a pretty substantial drop off in quality if we get too dry. So if we're monitoring our, our kernel maturity, our whole plant moisture, and, and if we move past the snaplage phase of, of say 40% moisture, maybe I'll put that as a minimum out there, then maybe it's time to start thinking about shelling that corn for high moisture uh, corn because that, that stover will be a little bit drier, I think. Um, but maybe that's not feasible with uh, the, the types of equipment we have, the, the implements, the, the harvesting equipment we have. I, don't know, I hope I hit, hit on that, that question. That one could go a few different ways. I think so. Um, sort of related, the next question here, what is your opinion on shredlage technology that's available right now? 
Yeah, shred ledge technology is, is pretty cool. And I, I know there are a number of different approaches. Uh, maybe, maybe we consider them alternative uh, kernel processing. But with shred ledge, where we've got, uh, I think, a little bit more data than perhaps some others, what we see is an improvement in starch digestibility. So kind of like that uh, en enzyme technology uh, with, with Enigen, shred ledge looks to, through the shearing motion, if you're watching me on the video, uh, rather than just our traditional KP, which is just kind of a rolling, like two rolling pins, uh, what Shredledge does is, is it applies a little bit of, of a, a shearing uh, motion to the, the KP, and that looks to be much more aggressive in terms of uh, kernel processing and really breaks that, that grain and, and busts open that endosperm and improves our starch digestibility. So I'm a fan of Shredledge. Anything we can do to improve our kernel processing, I think will let us get into silage a little bit sooner and let us achieve more value per ton uh, and optimize that feeding potential. All right, thank you. Um, in a corn crop that's dealing, that's being affected by heat stress, are there any products that can be used to help maintain good quality of the kernel, maybe help the corn get through the tasseling process? Uh, another good question. I, I think at this point with us uh, being, being a few weeks into uh, silk and tasseling, I, I think the window is probably is, has probably passed from a crop protection standpoint. Uh, well, well, I have a, a degree from the University in Agronomy and a bit of background in plant breeding and genetics. I, I really don't know all that much in that space from a practical standpoint. So I would lean on our uh, expert agronomists to help us out there. Uh, but I think the question is, is getting toward, could we apply some sort of fungicide to help us in preventing any further plant, further plant disease? What Damon's taught me in years past is that really the ideal time to apply a fungicide is around sil silking and tasseling as, as a lot of the uh, uh, fungal infestation happens by way of, of the silk into the ear and, and into the stalk. Uh, I think at this point, getting out and applying a fungicide, perhaps to try and prevent a uh, tar spot, I don't know that that's necessarily going to have a, a big impact for us relative to the $35 to $40 per acre application costs uh, that, that I think it, it would uh, require. But uh, th that would be something that I would really lean closely on our, our agronomy advisors. No, that makes sense. Going back, you know, we, we talked quite a bit about inoculants already. Someone is wondering about their impact in baleage and does that ensiling time, is it reduced if you're using an inoculant in baleage? Any comments there? So baleage is a, a really cool feed. I, I don't, uh, from a management standpoint, it, it's a kind of a, a pain in the side because every bale is probably just a little bit different. We need to go through the, the wrapping process. Uh, of either individual bales or, or uh, wrapping them up in a tube. But from a feed quality standpoint, dairy cattle love baleage. And, and I think that has to do with uh, a couple of things, but a, a higher sugar content uh, due to maybe a, a more rapid uh, and successful upfront fermentation. So what we see with baleage is that uh, we harvest hay a little bit wetter, uh, it's packed and then we wrap it and, it and it can ferment pretty quickly, preserving more of, of that sweet sugar that, that dairy cows tend to, to really love and go after. I think adding an inoculant, uh, in particular an upfront or homofermentative uh, organism, can help uh, achieve that optimal fermentation, speed it up just a little bit. So it certainly won't hurt. Uh, in terms of the the added benefit, return on investment, I mean, there are quite a few factors that go into a successful fermentation. Uh, moisture. Uh, packing density, getting that packed very, very tightly, getting all air or as much air out of the system as we can, uh, getting it covered uh, with a very robust uh, plastic, possibly a, a, an oxygen limiting plastic, uh, or in the case of baleage, just wrapping it up very quickly. And then the time uh, between harvest and, and wrapping or ensiling, all of those factors go in, in addition to a bacterial inoculant. So each of them can can have the, their own impact, but a bacterial inoculant on baleage certainly can help us. Very good. Now we're gonna switch gears to a few questions that are more nutrition related. So um, this person's asking, how accurate is TDN for lactation needs or would we be better served using um, NE for lactation? So uh, T TDN, uh, and, and I'll put a, I'm, I'm notorious for putting shameless plugs into uh, other other work I'm tied into, but I'm going to be discussing this in an upcoming feeding fundamentals column. Maybe hopefully you and, and Corey and the team don't mind me mentioning this, but TDN is a function, like I mentioned, where we look at nutrient content, nutrient digestibility. And as I've learned from Bill Weiss, who put together uh, 
originally at OARDC, uh, ORDAC, uh, the summative equation, we account for nutrient content, nutrient digestibility. And, and why I go back to that is there are a lot of different ways to estimate total digestible nutrients or TDN. Uh, some are as simple as just using the ADF or acid detergent fiber content in a hay and then predicting TDN solely based on that ADF. I hate that approach. I think it's uh, much more accurate and appropriate to be using an approach that accounts for fiber content, fiber digestibility, starch content, starch digestibility, and other factors. Uh, in terms of TDN versus net energy or, or, or some energy uh, value on a feed analysis report or within a diet model, it's a pretty straightforward calculation from TDN to NE. So it'll, it'll be TDN uh, to, to ME, to GE, to, to maybe net energy for lactation or, or for growth. So uh, understanding that TDN is at the basis of a lot of these equations or calculations, I, I'd suggest just simplifying and using TDN uh, as, as an index value if you want. But please recognize there are a lot of different approaches to getting at TDN. MILK 2006 was really an advance in, in estimating TDN, uh, but MILK 2006 is 15 years old and doesn't account for some of the silage quality tools we have at our fingertips today. So I think uh, there are probably a, a few more accurate approaches today to estimating TDN, like I mentioned. Okay. Next question. What is the optimal pH and the optimal lactic versus acetic acid ratio in corn silage? Here the adjunct professor in me is going to come out in my response. Uh, it depends. So the uh, optimal pH and lactate to acetate ratio or, or the fermentation profile, it's going to depend upon the crop and it's also going to depend upon the moisture. Uh, if we harvest wetter feeds and let's think about our hay or haylage crops, the more water we have in the feed, the more acid it's going to take to drive that pH down and, and get to the point where bacterial growth ceases. Whereas with a drier crop, a little bit less moisture, we can uh, we can get away with a little bit higher pH. But generally speaking, we seek to achieve a pH of less than 4.5 for our alfalfa and grass crops and a pH of less than 4 for our C4 crops in corn silage, sorghum, sudan, milo, millet, things along those lines. Part of that is also due to the buffering capacity in these forages. Corn silage, uh, other warm season grasses, they just don't uptake calcium and potassium and magnesium like our grass or, or haylage crops do. Uh, so the more buffer we have in terms of calcium, potassium, more buffering capacity, ash is also something to take into account. Uh, it's more difficult to drive that pH down. So that's where I think 4.5 is acceptable for our haylage crops, uh, but 4 is, is the target for our, our corn silage type crops. In terms of uh, fermentation profile then, as we looked at, at the, the lactate and acetate or lactic acid, acetic acid, it depends upon the uh, approach we took. If it's a, an epiphytic, meaning just natural fermentation, we don't use any bacterial inoculant, uh, or if perhaps we use a, a chemical preservative, uh, the, the fermentation acids are interpreted a little bit differently. Generally, we want to see a three to one or better lactate to acetate ratio. However, if we uh, if we utilize objective two or, or go down to that uh, heterofermentative bacteria and inoculant approach, uh, in that case, we do desire some acetic acid that is actually uh, beneficially produced by that hetero heterofermentative organism that acts as a preservative. Uh, so it, it's a pretty complex question that we need to look at a few different aspects of the forage analysis report. But just to bring it back, uh, pH less than 4 for corn silage, less than 4.5 for haylage crops, generally a lactate to acetate of 3 to 1. Uh, in the exception of a uh, lactobacillus buchneri or a heterofermentative bacteria uh, case, in that situation, having an acetic acid level of 1.5 to 2.5 is just fine. All right. And let's say you have a really good corn silage crop and the quality is there. What is your recommendation for protein sources to best complement um, corn silage? So if we've got, let's and let's say we're feeding a, a pretty typical high silage diet, so two thirds to more of our forage is coming from corn silage. Uh, so we, we, we're able to offset a lot of our supplemental grain. We get very digestible starch, hopefully with very good digestible fiber, uh, but we need to bring in some digestible protein and maybe some rumen bypass protein. Uh, part of that's gonna depend on what we have at uh, our disposal or what we have uh, in, in close proximity. So. For some areas to the, to the west or to the south, soybean meal is likely a, a better option to balance corn silage and the digestible fiber and starch uh, in corn silage. But for uh, more northern dairies, maybe closer to Canada, where, where some of our canola meal is coming out of, canola meal can fit very well also and, and bring in some digestible fiber. Uh, in terms of rumen bypass, feed stuffs. Uh, we, we've got a wide array of different uh, proteins on the market from animal proteins to heat treated 
uh, soy and maybe even a few expeller type canola meals that can bring some room and bypass. So I think it's more dictated by what we have in, in close proximity as opposed to what I think the ideal protein is uh, to bring into our diets because uh, today's nutritionists are exceptional. We, we can make anything work provided we can land feeds on farm uh, at, at kind of an optimal or, or, or an economic price point. And I am just fine with a, a soy relative to a canola based protein. I, I think we can probably also consider DDGs again. I, uh, distillers grains, I've fed a lot of that in the past, wet distillers grains in particular, and it got a bad rap for some of our mycotoxin uh, issues and contamination, as well as quite very uh, variable results in nutrition analysis and moisture from week to week, uh, particularly with our wetter feeds. But I think through a little bit more advanced uh, nutritional analysis strategy where we're looking at commodities week to week, uh, and then also uh, the, the ethanol plants, I think, have, have done a, a be much better job in their quality control. We can also consider bringing back DDGs, uh, as, as we also recognize with the, the recent uh, act that's been passed by, by our Congress in, um, here in the United States. I think there might be a, a bit more ethanol or, or maybe a, a, a some alternative feeds that, that might come, uh, come more available or at, at a lower price point as well into the future, uh, coming out of uh, sustainability initiatives. Great points there. And we this is our final question, and I think this is a really good way to wrap up the Q&As. Um, this person's wondering, besides yield, in your opinion, what are the key factors that people should be looking for when deciding which hybrids to plant for corn silage in 2023? Uh, this is a good one to, to key up for discussions to follow over the next couple of quarters looking into 23. So yield is part of the equation, but I'd really like to see us transition from just thinking a total tonnage, total yield standpoint to digestible tons. And we can get to digestible tons in different fashions through fiber, through starch. But if we can get an idea of tonnage and couple that with total digestible nutrients, we can we can then use TDN yield as our uh, as our benchmark perhaps to compare and evaluate seed genetics. And uh, I would encourage you all to, uh, if you're not already doing some sort of strip trials on your farm or, or some sort of seed plot and evaluation, our seed companies and our university hybrid trials are fantastic sources of information, but that interaction between genotype and environment and growing environment on your farm is pretty big. Uh, so I would like to see us better, uh, better better take ownership in uh, evaluating our seed genetics, not simply relying on uh, seed genetic or seed brochures and university data. And in terms of uh, the, the, the other aspects we should consider, it's it's going to be fiber content, fiber digestibility, starch content, starch digestibility, calculating that TDN in conjunction with your nutritionist, your agronomist, your seed consultant, then matching that up to yield and, and using that as your selection criteria. And then one last aspect that we need to come back to and fold into our evaluation is, is disease resistance or plant health. Uh, this is something we, we might have taken for granted in years past, but with tar spot in particular coming onto the scene in the last five years, and with the disease pressure we, we seem to have been having and, and a little bit more emphasis on cleaner feed, I think looking at and evaluating plant health and, or, or taking that into account with our seed genetic evaluation is also important. Uh, another thing that Damon has taught me is that uh, tar spot in particular, uh, th there is something to do with seed genetics in terms of resistance. So we can have similar uh, disease pressure, but some hybrids are hit a lot harder than other hybrids. So uh, look for some data there as well to use. Well, John, I'll, along with all these questions, we also got several compliments for your presentation, um, people letting you know you did an excellent job, and I would echo their comments. So thank you so much for taking time to prepare this presentation and then answering all these questions that followed. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, join with you and, and, and get some uh, food for thought out with, with all of our producers, all of our harvesters out there. I wish you all a, a safe and successful harvest season. I, I probably didn't stress safety as much as I could have, but please be safe this season. And uh, I look forward to, to future opportunities to, to help you all out and, and team up with uh, Abby and the Hordes German team. Yes. So um, once again, thank you to John Gazer from Rock River Laboratory for being our webinar presenter this month and sharing all this good information on the corn silage harvest and feeding corn silage um, on our dairy farms. I also like to extend a thank you to my teammates, Patty and Michaela, for all their work on the production side of the webinars. And last but not least, we want to thank all of you for joining us, um, whether you tune in every month or just occasionally. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day or your night, depending where you are in the world to listen into these presentations. So thank you for being so attentive for all your good questions and we look forward to having you join us again. For now, 
Um, from all of us here at our team at Hordes Dairyman, I want to thank you for your participation. And um, until next time, take care and um, stay healthy, stay safe. And we look forward to um, joining you again in a future month. Goodbye, everyone.